Order of Business, State of Play of Negotiations with the United Kingdom. For the European Liberal and Democratic Alliance, Mr. Giefer Hofstadt. First of all, I have to tell you that, um, and I, I say that also to Mr. Fito, I deplore uh, that we have to come to a resolution uh, that is saying that there is no sufficient progress. Um, our idea, and I think also of Michel Barnier, was uh, that uh, in, in October uh, we could see sufficient progress. But Mr. Weber is right when he is analyzing the situation. If you are at the other side of the negotiation table, uh, there is a lack of clarity. There is even disunity. Uh, there are oppositions between Hammond and Fox. There are oppositions uh, and divisions, I should say, between Johnson and May. It is difficult to make sufficient progress. And it is difficult to make uh, the steps towards uh, the second phase of the negotiation. So I deplore, in fact, that we are not capable to put uh, for you before the plenary uh, another resolution than the resolution of today. But on the other hand, it shows also uh, the unity uh, among uh, ourselves. And I hope that we can keep, Mr. Vito, this uh, unity uh, in this House. And even that you can join uh, this unity uh, when there is the vote uh, within a few uh, moments. Because this unity uh, is absolutely needed. Uh, Parliament and Council, so not only Parliament, Parliament and Council for once, I have never seen it, I have to tell you in my political life, are going beyond national difference, are going beyond party obediences, and are really defending, together with the negotiator, the interests of uh, the citizens in all 27 member states. And so my call to you and to everybody in the plenary is join this unity. Let's keep this unity. And in that respect, uh, dear colleagues, I have uh, yeah, three, three worries, three points that I want to, uh, uh, that I think are, are needed to be addressed uh, in, in this debate. The first is Northern, uh, Northern Ireland. I have to tell you, I went to Northern Ireland. I was never in Northern Ireland. I was never in Belfast. But I went there, and I thought, yeah, it's already 20 years, not longer on our television screen. Uh, problems are solved. It's a little bit like Berlin. The Berlin Wall, it disappeared and everything goes well. well. I can tell you it was a shock to come in Belfast because the reality is that the problems are not over. There is peace uh, due to the Good Friday Agreement, but there are still these tensions. That there are fences of 12 meters high today in the 21st century. And uh, I have to tell you, this Good Friday Agreement, to keep it, is Key, uh, is key. It's a ceasefire. It's uh, a little bit the guarantee of, an, of a frozen conflict. And the worst thing what can happen is that we lose the peace that Europe has brought there uh, in uh, Northern Ireland with the efforts we with the European Union uh, have done. I stand next to these memorial monuments of young people. Of young people. I stand there next to memorial monuments where you see the pictures of young people of 15, 16 years old who died in a conflict based on nationalism, based on extremism. And so to secure that this violence doesn't return, that is, I think, an absolute priority for our house. And that means why not, why not, why not? And it's a question. It's a question that I put forward uh, to the, the, the negotiator. Why not this Good Friday Agreement uh, attach then as a, as a declaration uh, to uh, the withdrawal agreement that we are uh, going to secure? And also, to be sure, let's not return to a border there on the, uh, uh, island, uh, uh, the island of Ireland, because then the violence uh, will certainly return. So my second worry is about citizens' rights. So, uh, you know, these so-called uh, deportation letters that had been sent by the UK uh, authorities uh, a few time uh, ago. Uh, there has been excuses by the UK government saying that it was a mistake, but I have difficult to believe it. And why I'm saying this? When it uh, comes to collectively securing the rights of US citizens living in the UK, UK authorities tell us that it's not possible. They, they don't know them. They don't know where they are. Well, it concerns to send a deportation letter, they find them. Yeah. And they find their addresses. So I don't think that really we can accept, and, and, and I want to tell that in all honesty and, and very calm, a, a 
a situation in which 3 million of our citizens will need to ask for a settled status in Britain with the huge administrative burden. Our proposal is very simple. Let's recognize this collectively. Let's give the same rights for the people living in the UK now, EU citizens, as they have now. And let's do exactly the same for the UK citizens living on the continent. I'm asking myself, I'm asking myself, I'm asking myself, President, why we are still discussing this. This can, in fact, be solved immediately, recognizing their rights, recognizing the rights of all citizens. Finally, on the financial settlement, I will not repeat what you have said. We are fully in agreement with you. You cannot pay with 27 what has been committed by 28. And so, to conclude, my last phrase. It's true, Theresa May, Mr. Fito, have made a number of clarifications in her Florence speech. Not enough, let's be honest, also for you to say that there is sufficient progress. So what I'm hoping is that on, in her address now, tomorrow, uh, in the Congress before the Conservative Party, she will bring further clarity. So that based on this further clarity, concrete proposals can be put on the negotiation table towards uh, uh, Michel Barnier. And finally, I hope for really, also from the ECR group, for a massive support for this resolution at the vote at May Day. Thank you. For the Europe of the direct uh, freedom and direct democracy, Mr. Farage. The really important issue of Brexit, I think European citizens, those that do take any interest in what happens here, will be stunned that Mr. Juncker comes here for his one appearance in the Strasbourg session this week, and there is absolutely no mention made of the dramatic events that have taken place inside a European Union member state that is allegedly a modern democracy. Now, one of, the reasons that I, one of the reasons that I always wanted Brexit was because I thought the system of lawmaking whereby the Commission has the sole right to initiate legislation was something that would in fact damage and in the end destroy any concept of national democracy. And yeah, I've called the European Union undemocratic, I've called it anti-democratic, but never Ever in, in my fiercest criticisms here did I think we would see the police of a member state of the Union injuring 900 people in an attempt to stop them going out to vote. Whether or not, whether or not, whether or not it was legal nationally for people in Catalonia to have a vote, surely, surely people are allowed to express an opinion. We saw women being dragged out of polling stations by their hair, old ladies with gashes in their forehead. The most extraordinary display. And what do we get from Mr. Juncker today? Not a dicky bird. In fact, previously we had that the rule of law must be maintained. And I think it is quite extraordinary to realize that this union is prepared to turn a blind eye. Can you imagine, can you imagine if the British police were to have roughed up a couple of Scottish National Party protesters, or if, if, if something happened against a pro-Brexit rally, you'd all be screaming blue murder. Indeed, the calls would be that the United Kingdom must go before the European Court of Human Rights, and yet with this, you don't even want to talk about it. And I, knowing as I do, your advanced plans, seven of you, uh, member states here with your military police, your Euro gendarmerie force, all I can say once again is thank God we're leaving. Brexit was an act of liberation. It was a, a voice of national self-determination that cannot and will not be stopped. But through this negotiating process, I'm afraid from the start, you've treated us as if we're some kind of hostage. That unless we pay a ransom, unless we meet all of your demands, all of your demands, then you won't even have an intelligent conversation with us about trade heading on from here. There are no guarantees that whatever Mrs May says or does, that you will ever, even when we've met your demands, that you will ever come to us and want to have a sensible trade agreement. And I have to say, I have to say that it is sad, in fact it was pitiful, to see the British Prime Minister in Florence. I've heard you saying that she's been conciliatory, um, that she's been grown up, 
Uh, people are happy with what she said. Actually, Mrs May, I'm sad to say, isn't worldly enough to recognise uh, that when you face up to a bully, the one thing that you do not do is try to appease them. She's begging you to give her a transition period and there's no guarantee that you will do it. So I do actually agree with the criticisms that I've heard around the room about the mixed messages coming out from the UK government. I just hope that in Manchester, the Conservative Party start to say in public what they're all saying to me in private, that she's a waste of space, she needs to go. We need a proper Prime Minister who says to Monsieur Barnier, OK, here's a deadline, here's a date, we work towards that date. If we can't reach a sensible deal on trade and everything else, then we are simply leaving and reverting to WTO rules. This charade cannot go on for year after year. After all, we voted Brexit. Yeah. For the Europe of Nations and Freedom Group, Mrs Atkinson. I agree with everything Nigel has said. Um, the, people, the British people listen to you and they hear that you want us shackled to the ECJ and they say no. Um, the British people see that uh, you're, you will, you're getting an EU army and given what happened in Catalonia on Sunday, most of you so-called leaders um, were silent on this matter. Uh, you saw what was happened with the violence against its people, its women and some of them were children and they wonder what it will be like under Mrs Merkel and also Mr Macron when they get their hands on the guns and the tanks. The British people say no. The British people say no. They voted to take back control of our borders and you say no. The UK said yes to leaving the single market and the customs union so you should just cut a deal on a free trade agreement but you can't. Has Mrs May met Mrs Maelstrom, our resident former sociology lecturer who is in charge of trade? She is incapable of saying yes or no because she's never worked in business. Last night at the Conservative Party conference, a former Brexit minister with the Brexit secretary, David Davis, in the audience said that the Brexit department are drawing up plans for a no deal. Well, listening to Mr Barnier today, they better get on with it because that's what's going to happen. Mr Webber, you say who you should you call in London. I agree with you. Mrs May will be gone soon. I suggest you get Boris or Jacob on speed dial. And Mr Verhofstadt, don't lecture us and try and rewrite history on Northern Ireland. I think it's you that's inciting violence sitting in this chamber. Last June, we voted to take back control of our laws, our courts, our borders and our money. Anything else is a betrayal of 17.4 million people. Watch and learn from Catalonia. Um, Mr. Batten, please. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we're here to discuss the state of play of the negotiations and what progress has been made. Well, very little, uh, and there are two main reasons for that. One, of course, is that you don't want us to leave. You're going to do everything you possibly can to make it as difficult as possible, to delay it as long as possible, so that either we end up with a very, very bad deal or we reverse the decision of the referendum. The second reason, of course, is Mrs May, who simply doesn't have a clue. She has neither the courage, the will, nor the resolve to actually see these so-called negotiations through. Uh, but Mrs May has made some very serious and dangerous concessions already. What has she actually said? Uh, Fifteen months already after the referendum, nothing much has changed. She intends that we should leave the European Union on the, uh, March 2019. We will leave the Commission, we will leave the Council, we will no longer have members of the European Parliament. We've left. But nothing much very changes. Uh, nothing much at all changes. She said that we are going to incorporate all EU law into UK law and then she wants another two years transition period which will take us up to five years from the referendum during which case nothing much changes on immigration. The laws don't change and she has made one very, very, very dangerous concession which is talking about an EU treaty on security and defence. We will continue to be bound to your military ambitions. We will continue to be bound to your security uh, policy and foreign policy and to all the police and justice criminal police and criminal justice measures like the hated European arrest warrant. She has not got a clue and what she'll end up with is a withdrawal agreement whereby we leave in name but we do not leave in reality. Now Mr Barnier, Mr Juncker, 
I don't understand why you don't actually make it easy for us to leave. Why don't you kick us out as quick as possible? Because then you can get on with your ambitions for full economic, financial, political and military integration. You can create your United States of Europe, make it easy for us to go so that we can get on with pursuing our freedom and independence, prosperity and our future in the world, not in the EU. Do yourself and us a favour, please. Well, uh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. President, Abraham Lincoln famously once said, you can fool some of the people all of the time. You can fool all of the people some of the time, but you can never fool all of the people all of the time. Well, the British people are no longer fooled that the EU want to negotiate a fair Brexit agreement or even negotiate at all. From Verhofstadt to Juncker, to Barnier and to Tusk, the message is clear. The EU will delay, damage and deny Brexit. When President Tusk says the UK can't have its cake and eat it, what he actually means is the EU wants its cake, our cake, the morning croissant, afternoon tea and finishing it with taking a pound of Britain's economic flesh washed down with a glass of subsidised EU Chianti. As Shakespeare said, this England never did nor never shall lie at the feet of a proud conqueror. It's clear the EU will not change its tune, so it's time for the UK to walk away and end this charade. Thank you. Honorable Brock. Mr. Brock. Honorable Henkel. Mr. Henkel. Thank you. Well, I would like to make it very clear from the beginning. I was against Brexit. And Mr. Gonzalez Pons made the point that uh, after Brexit, people like Farage are leaving this parliament. Well, I would like to remind you, not only him, but all British people are leaving this parliament. And these are the last advocates in this parliament who are in favor of competitiveness, of decentralization, and of self-responsibility of a country for its debts. But it was, and let's not forget it, it was the Junkers, it was the Brocks. It was the Verhofstadt in this parliament who carry a lot of responsibility for the Brexit in the first place. It was their mantra for more Europe, more centralization, more socialization, which led to the referendum in the first place. And it was their inflexibility on the immigration issue which gave the arguments for the Johnsons and the Farages to swing the results towards Brexit. To minimize the damage, we now need to do three things. First of all, Mr. Verhofstadt, people like you should stop this arrogance vis-à-vis -vis the British voters. <laughs> Secondly, Mr. Barnier, you should stop giving the impression that you want to punish the British for their decision. And here's a message to London. They should really get their act together and come up with a stable and unified government to face this commission in this critical phase. La parola all Honorable James. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's certainly bash up the Brits day, isn't it? And can I give the uh, Parliament here a gold medal for political bullying? Because that's quite frankly what we've heard so far. A number of people have referred to the lack of clarity of documents coming from the United Kingdom. Can I remind everybody that there was an agreement between both parties to keep those details confidential? And it's taken individuals in this Parliament to divulge and criticise the United Kingdom because we have not been forthcoming. Well, I've got more faith in my politicians that abide by confidentiality agreements than I have by a number of the individuals in the Parliament this morning. Now, one of my political colleagues back in the United Kingdom during the referendum campaign made a very, very strong statement, which is the United Kingdom should not be a star on somebody else's flag. It quite clearly appears to be that this parliament wants to erase the United Kingdom from the flag, but it wants to keep everything that the United Kingdom contributes, be it money, be it defence forces, be it knowledge, whatever it might be. Well, if you want that, Go back to the negotiating rules. Go back and understand what negotiation actually means. It means giving a bit to get something back in return. You have not given one iota. 
It is all very well holding 27 member states together in terms of unity, but quite frankly, what we are seeing now is a facade and theatre from the Parliament in terms of the negotiations. They are not serious, and the sooner this country, the United Kingdom, leaves, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Reintika, one minute, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, dear colleagues, dear Mr. Barnier. As a politician, I understand that political negotiations take time, that legal studies need to be conducted, that there are political games being played, and maybe I even understand that this side of this parliament wants to, you know, make a circus out of this. But as a citizen, I must admit that I'm still completely lost on what the British government actually wants out of these negotiations. And I think that this is deeply worrying. And this is why I have two points to Theresa May, and I think she can clarify this tomorrow in her speech at the Party Congress. Finally, Madam Prime Minister, let us know, and the millions of citizens that are waiting for this, what the British government actually wants out of these negotiations. And secondly, and I think this is also an important signal to send here from this European Parliament, never forget that there is still a way out of this mess. The strength of a leader is not demonstrated by stubbornness, but by insight. You can still turn this around, Madam May. It is high time to do so. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. Madam Zelstra, one minute, please. Mr. Zelstra. Madam, thank you very much. As we've already said, well, Mr. Juncker has run off. I have been in the UK, and really nobody has any understanding for Brussels anymore. Mrs. May has made a proposal whereby people can have permanent settled status, and the EU has rejected that. It is offered to make certain payments, but the EU is clamoring for more and more, and it is rejecting any talk of a free trade agreement. And I have to say, uh, we have to lay all these allegations at the EU's door. And this is a country, after all, which beat the Germans. And Brussels, Brussels, is, is offended. Uh, the UK wants to leave the EU um, and we are now hearing that Brussels um, has uh, um, its own views about Catalonia, but that is a moral failure on the part of the European Union. Mr. Brewa, one minute. Oui, Madame la Présidente, chers collègues. Yes, Madam President, colleagues, in this resolution you require the British to respect free movement of individuals and respect of the judgments of the European Court of Justice. So we've understood the European Union wants to make the British people pay for their legitimate desire for freedom and sovereignty. Let's remember what's happened. As soon as Article 50 of the treaty was triggered, we saw a, an avalanche of demands and threats from the European Union which is on the ropes because the fact is the European Union is afraid. It's afraid the United Kingdom will do better outside the Union than in, which obviously could encourage other member states to follow the United Kingdom towards national sovereignty. The negotiations are actually a process of blackmail which is unacceptable. But Brexit will at least have had the merit of showing the true colours of the European Union, anti-democratic and unable to respect the will of peoples. You can't negotiate with a revolver held to your head. Therefore, I think the European Union must be destroyed.